Welcome to the heart of the matter. In today's episode, we'll be talking to Mr. Tox Adebi, who is the author of a book entitled Joyful. Joyful is a book that will teach you how to live a peaceful and fulfilled life. So stay tuned as we bring you Mr. Tox Adebi. Things sometimes I sound um, I said that the financial cost as one of the many things was enormous. Well, the God experience wanted to find God simply feeling like you're in fire. It is always so. Tell us about the solution. As one of the many things. to 35 years of age out of work. Hey, I don't have the skills for this particular problem to solve this particular problem. None of us talked about the bread seller. Once again, you're welcome to the heart of the matter where we're talking with Mr. Tox Adebi, who has a lot of things to share about the inspiration for his, this book, his book called Joyful. Um, you're welcome to the heart of the matter, Tooks. Thank you for having me. Now, you were born in the United Kingdom in London. Yes, I But was. you lived most of your formative years here in yes. Nigeria before returning later to the United Kingdom. Tell us your story. We want to understand what was behind this book, Joyful, which has, has so far been quite a successful book with, with the people that are reading it and the feedback that you're getting. Thank you for having me again. Uh, much appreciated. Um, so I'll tell you about a bit about my story. Um, I was born in the UK whilst my mom was on a uh, course. My mom's a doctor, so she was on a the course there. And um, not long after having me, uh, we went back to Nigeria. So the first few years of my life, I lived in a place called Shagamu mm -hmm. in, in Ogun State in Nigeria, uh, a place called Wapko Estate, West African Portland Cement okay. Estate. My dad used to work there. And for the first few years, um, it was quite an affluent place to live. Um, it was a gated community of detached houses. And, but you, you sort of noticed the poverty on the outside upon leaving the estates you notice a lot of things outside. Even as young as I was, I did notice the poverty on the outside, uh, but didn't pay too much attention to it because my immediate surroundings, everything was good. So th from then on, uh, after some time, my dad uh, kind of moved companies uh, from Wapco. I think he went into, um, he became self-employed and went into hotel business. Uh, so he, he parted ways with Wapco, and we had to leave the estate because it was one of these corporate estates where when you're working for the company, you have to live there, or you can, you can live there. Um, when we left Wapco, we were due to move to Lagos. At the time, I was very upset about it because I knew most of my, all your friends, my friends, all my, that were, yeah, everyone Wapco. I knew was in Wapco. Mm -hmm. But my mom did a good job of selling it to us because most of our cousins who lived in Lagos, we always viewed them as more advanced than we were. <laughs> so we looked at, okay, we, maybe we're moving up in the world. Um, but unfortunately, when we arrived in Lagos, we arrived in a place called Mushin. Okay. Which you probably Quite know. Quite a difference from, from living uh, in a gated estate in Wapco. Exactly. So my first experience of Lagos was Mushin. Upon arriving in Mushin, I could not help but notice the children that were running around in their underwear. Um, I could not help but notice that our property, the pro house that we would eventually live in whilst we were there, was the best house on the road. It wasn't that great, but it was the best house on the road. Mm -hmm. And I could not help but notice that the quality of life that we were living had suddenly dropped. Mm -hmm. I mean, even in the house itself, the things and the amenities in the house, Electricity, uh, electricity, day-to-day -day life. Mm -hmm. I could not help but notice. But uh, being so young, um, I mean, as long as you have food, you've got water, you you you, you notice, but it doesn't and of sink course, in as much. Schools anymore. would have changed, so you're now mixing with an, another different set of people at school. Exactly. So. Now d you just hit it because where it really started to hit home that things had changed was at school. Mm. Now we went to a school, um, University of Lagos Staff School. That's, okay. That was where okay. I started uh, my primary education. Not started, so I, I got in there at primary three, mm -hmm. actually. Um, at that school, there were quite a few affluent people there. It was a bit mixed, affluent and middle yeah. class, and uh, some not so middle class. At the school, I started to notice a lot of things that I never really experienced as much before. 
if you are not one of the kids who carried the latest bags, if you didn't wear the sort of the latest shoes, mm -hmm. you were not classed as one of the cool kids and you didn't quite fit in. From primary school, mm -hmm. there was a bit of a divide between those who are from well-to-do homes and those who are not as well off. There was, there was a very clear divide. You could see those who maybe on summer holidays went to England for holidays and all that. You could tell who they were and who they sort of mixed with from primary school. Mm -hmm. did, did this provoke some sort of, you know, because you've, you've, you're living with people from a, a, a poor background, did this provoke some sort of, I don't want to use the word outrage, in you concerning the way that poor people were being treated? Not at that time. It did not, I wouldn't say provoked outrage in me. What it did was make me think to myself that I want to be like them. Mm -hmm. I, want to, I, I, I want to sort of mix with them. I want them to be my friends. I want to be one of the cool kids. Mm -hmm. It made me want to feel among. It made me want to be among them. And at the time, uh, my mother was the one who was really taking care of us to a good, good extent. Um, and she didn't have that much money. We were five of us kids. So pocket money was very limited. School lunch money was very limited. So and bags and all the things that those other guys carried. No, mine was all made in Nigeria, mm -hmm. which is not a bad thing now that I know, yeah. uh, now that I'm wiser. But back then, made in Nigeria versus made in the UK, there was a bit of a difference. Mm -hmm. And you were made to know that there was a difference. So. I was always trying to fit in with those children, always trying to, you know, doing everything I could to mix with them, doing everything I could to be among them and feel accepted by them. What was their reaction to you? It never quite worked out. It never quite worked out. I was always on the outside. I was always the one that, and well, not just me, I, mean, I know there were a few other kids who were like me, who were trying to fit in. Uh, but for me at the time, it felt like I just was not cool enough to be like them. And most of all, I needed to move out of Mushin because, I mean, in conversations, they'll be, where do you live? Well, I live in Suleri, I live on the island. Where do you live? I live in Mushin. That was just a deal breaker. <laughs> so I, I knew I needed to move out of Mushin. Not long after that, we only stayed in Mushin for a year, but it felt like forever. Uh, but not long after that, we moved out to Mushin. And we moved to a place called Ebutemeta. Um, LSDPC estate, we stayed there for a bit. And things started get progressively getting better. Whilst I was at uh, Ebutemeta, uh, then I went into secondary school. And I, I went into a school. Initially, I didn't go into King's College, but then I transferred into King's College. And then this is where what I was just describing to you was escalated. So now at secondary school, aware of a lot more. Now, at that time, I was a guy. And at, at being a guy, we were into girls. And you know, we wanted to be cool, wanted to go to the parties. So now I was a lot more aware of social things. And even though I was aware before, but now it was on a new level. And but things hadn't really changed that much financially. Um, we still didn't have that much in terms of money. And um, we were in a school where the, the rich were super rich. The rich were super rich in King's College. And going to parties, you, you know, when you, when you attended a party with these guys, you just see the girls flocking to them. I was still in the world at that time. So I was one of those boys who was always trying to mingle with the girls and mingle with the guys who were seen to be cool. But again, never quite fit in. Never quite fit in because I just I wouldn't go to England on holidays. We couldn't afford for me to go to England or any of my family members to go to England on holidays. So do have, when they're having conversations about, oh, yeah, we went to Trocadero, we went to this, we went to that, I just, you know, just sink into a shell and just, <laughs> and just hold, hold my own. Uh, and uh, it, it was clear that I, just, I was just trying to fit in. There are lots of other, there are lots of people probably at the age you were at then watching this program. 
What will you say to them? What should their response be if they find themselves in the situation you found yourself in where, where they're trying to fit in and, and they just can't because they, they can't? Well, my response to them is, first of all, what you're trying to fit in is a lie. It's a lie that you've created in your head. It's a lie that society has painted. You do not need to be accepted by these people. A lot of these so-called people that I was trying so hard to be accepted by, a lot of them I don't even know where they are right now. Many of them I may never see again. I deprived myself of studying for my education at that time because I was trying so hard to be a cool kid. I deprived myself of focusing on my studies and being the best I could be, you know, being who I was by trying to fit in. And in the end, I, I ended up not getting good grades. That put a lot of pressure on me, going to university, trying to get into university and all that, all for also impress people that I will never see again. Well, some of them I do see, but a lot of them I actually don't see again. We're going to come back in a moment mm -hmm. uh, to talk about the, the inspiration. What were the things that led to your, uh, your decision to put pen to paper? Viewers, we're, we're going to take a short break now, but we'll be back talking to Tox Adebi about the book Joyful. So stay tuned. Welcome back to the heart of the matter where we're talking to uh, Tokes Adebi. I was going to say Pastor Tokes Adebi, <laughs> which, which, which may be prophetic. Um, so where we're talking to Mr. Tokes Adebi about his book, Joyful. Now, Joyful is birthed from your experiences. Yes. And um, what were the experiences that made you decide that you must put pen to paper so that others won't have to go through or would know how to handle the, the experiences that you went through? Okay, that's a lovely question. Now, up until this point, we've discussed how I grew up. And I tell this story in the book because it's so important. Because whilst you're reading it, you can start to see the reasons why I wrote it. I've expressed how there was pressure to sort of fit in with the cool kids and how you, I wanted to do that because I wanted to do what they were doing and sort of be accepted by society. Now, along those lines, after my secondary school education, I came to the United Kingdom. And I came with that mindset that I had to be rich someday. I came with a hunger to be successful. At this point, we had moved to Ikoi uh, just before we came. And you know that Ikoi is the land of the super rich. So I lived here, but we weren't quite wealthy. But most people around us were very wealthy. So I, I had that desire within me that I had to be successful in business. I had, to be, uh, I had to be rich in order to be accepted by society, in order to be somebody who people could look at and say, ah, I want to be like him in the future. Because I wanted to be somebody. I, came to the, I went to the UK with this mindset. And this was the driving force for a lot of decisions that I took whilst at university. Whilst at university, I was not exactly born again at the time. I was Christian, I was raised a Christian, but I, I wouldn't call myself born again. I believed in God. Well, on this faithful day, I went clubbing with a friend. And we got back, and about 2 a.m. in the morning, this was very weird, about 2 a.m. in the morning, something just hit me. Talks, why can't you serve me? And I just called my friend. He is my best friend too today. And I just called him. I said, Uche, you believe in God? Yes, I do. I believe in God. Yes. Yeah, I, I know you do. Why can't we serve him? And we, 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 we thought about it, we discussed it, and we came to one reason alone, girls. As weird as that, sound, that, was, as weird as, as that sounds, that was the only reason that was really stopping us from serving God. The money was not really a thing. It was just girls. And we decided to each other. We said, you know, why don't we just 
try it out. Because we believe in God and we know that this world is coming to an end one day. Uh, you know, we're either going to heaven or we're going to hell. So why can't we just try it out one day uh, for some time and see how it goes? And on that day, that night, uh, this conversation took place around two and lasted maybe to like four. That night, we gave our lives to Christ. And we've not turned back since that day. We gave our lives to Christ. And things started changing from that day. I still had the desire to be rich. I still wanted to be somebody. So although I had given my life to Christ, that zeal and, and desire to be Richard Branson or, or you know, one of the top guys was still in me. Ali Godangote. Ali Godangote. That was still in me. Now, we carried on. I went to university. My mindset changed. I started focusing a bit more on my studies. I graduated with the first class. This is me who did not do well in uh, secondary school. I graduated with the first class. And I read a lot of motivational books. I read a lot. I read a lot of motivational books, uh, Kiyosaki's, Richard Branson's, you name it. I read them, all of them, on how to make money, how to be successful. Everyone was talking about think big. You know, think big, go for your dreams, go for your goals. You know, you can achieve. The only time you fail is when you give up. All these lines. I read all these books, and I believed them, and I went for them. I went for them wholeheartedly. I had businesses. I had uh, I, I, the time I was into oil. There was a time I, I, had, I had two restaurants in London. I had an estate agency. I had a property club with over 1,000 investors. I even had, I, I, whilst at university, I started a business, uh, an e-business for, for students where they could get access to travel, insurance. I was very business-minded. My, my, my course was business management at an IT. Well, you know what I found? I found that each time I achieved any of these goals, the joy was short-lived. I was Christian, and I was attending a lot of sermons as well because I was very involved in the church. I've always been very involved in church since I became born again. And I would go to church and hear a lot of sermons about being prosperous, prosperity, being prosperous, uh, praying to God, um, God wants you to be successful. I heard a lot of these sermons. So within me, knowing that I was the son of God, I felt I had to be successful. That it just, you know, if I have God on my side, there is no, I can't give up. I just will be successful financially. One day, when I was coming back from church, and I was driving home, I it's hard to explain this thing, but I saw and heard this clearly. Uh, I left my car. I was not driving my car anymore. And I saw a vision. I saw myself in the future. And I was on a platform giving a talk to a, 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 like a congregation. I, I, I didn't quite get the message of what I was saying to them. But what I knew I was saying, I was helping them live a more fulfilling life. That I knew. And whatever I was telling them at the point was benefiting them. And I loved what I saw. I really did like what I saw. At the end of the vision, I heard a voice. This is who I am going to make you. But it's not for you and your family alone. It is for the benefit of the church and for mankind. And then I go back in my car. As soon as I got back in my car, I just started thanking God because I knew without any doubt that God had just spoken to me. Two weeks later, my mother-in-law, well, not my mother-in-law, my brother's mother-in-law from the United States, who I don't really talk to, came and stayed with us. I was praying one night, and the next morning, she just called me and said, Tokes, whilst I was praying, I just got this message for you. I don't know what it is, that someone, God is going to make you this person that's going to be very influential or successful and it's not for you alone, it's for the benefit of the church and for my, without me ever having that so conversation with her. So that was your confirmation? That was my confirmation. I was still lost though because even though I received that word and I saw that vision, I thought, I interpreted that vision as I was successful as like a Richard Branson and I was helping these folk to achieve wealth. I was helping them to be successful in life financially, you know. That's what I thought. So the, the drive for me to go in that direction now became even stronger. 
And now I knew I could not fail because now God has even given me a clear vision, so I cannot fail. So I kept going down that line, pushing, pushing. But I kept failing. Each time in my business, things will be successful, things will be going up. And then all of a sudden, it just start coming down, coming down. Frustration, and I was just never satisfied and never happy. I got bored so easily. I'll do this, I'll get bored, I'll, you know, let's try that, get bored, let's try that, let's get bored. I got so, in the end, after a failure, a business failure, my wife, and now, now my wife, she has been my girlfriend for many years, she told me that, why don't you just go stay off business for some time? You study business management and you've done this consultancy thing in the past where you're going to companies and try and make things work. Just focus on that. Just go into companies, be working for them as your own business, but just be working for them and helping them fix their business just for some time. Take some time out of you know, being an entrepreneur and then let's see where it leads. And so I decided that, okay, it sounds like good advice, I'll do that because I've had so many failures anyway. But with that decision, I was not satisfied within me. I thought, ah, I've given up. And on this fateful day, we went on holiday to Tenerife. And on this fateful day, each day at night, in the evening, we would take my daughter, put her in the buggy, and uh, while she's asleep, we'll cover the buggy up, and then go for a meal. And on this fateful day, we were doing the same thing, same routine. And whilst we were taking her, I heard that voice again. And this time he said, you see your daughter? Look at your daughter in that buggy. You see how she's sleeping in that buggy? Without a concern in this world, all she knows is that daddy is pushing her in the buggy so she can sleep. She knows that wherever you take her to, she'll be okay. Why can't you be like that with me? That was now, that was the real turning point in my life. When I got that, you know you know when God has spoken to you. You just know because he speaks to each of us on like an individual basis. We know it. That message sank deep within me. And I knew from that moment that I just had to change my entire mindset of all these worries about, oh, not having money, or oh, this, that. That was where the change started. Now let's come to the book. Yes. Um, joyful is... It's not loud, it's not shouting yes. at you. It's a simple uh, uh, graphical yes. presentation, and that is intentional. That is very okay. intentional. Um, so what is it that you were striving to achieve with the book? This book is meant to help a lot of people who are like me. I see so much of myself in the world, so much of myself in the UK, it's there, big time. In Nigeria, it's here, even bigger. People are chasing things everywhere, thinking that it's going to give them joy. Thinking that by having a million pounds in your bank account, you, you are joy. somewhat secure. You are somewhat going to be happy. It is a lie. Those things don't give you joy. I've chased these things, and I know I have achieved goals, many of these goals. What happens is when you achieve these things, it just, your heart develops a bigger goal. And then you start chasing something even bigger. You achieve a million pounds today, tomorrow is going to go into two million pounds that you're going to be chasing. And the pursuit is endless. That does not give you joy. In my book, Joyful, a truthful guide to finding peace and living a fulfilling life, I lay out everything that I have found on how you can live a joyful life. Loving your neighbor as yourself. Being there, nothing gives me joy like putting smiles on people's faces. Yeah, you've, you've said loving your neighbor yes. as yourself. Yes. How do you love your neighbor as yourself? What uh, are the kinds of things that that right. make you do? Before I say loving your neighbor, I say loving your, as, as yourself. The as yourself part of it is very important as well. What tends to happen is people find it hard to strike the balance between as yourself and your neighbor. So you've got to love yourself. You've got to love yourself. And the self you're loving is the self that God made. Yes. Not, not man's image of himself, but God's image of who you are. Exactly. Okay. You've got to be, you be yourself, be confident. If, if people are not going to like you as you, then they're really not meant to be with you. They're not meant to be your friends. If they can't accept you for who you are. And I find that the people you try the hardest to please are the people who actually don't matter to you. 
the people who matter tend to accept you for who you are. You know, your family, your wife, you know, people who matter, your children, they tend to accept you as you. I, I focus a lot on love in my book because I found that by putting smiles on people's faces in your community, it's, I, it just gives you this sense of achievement, this sense of joy inside of you that you cannot buy with money. It's, joy is one thing that is very hard to describe in words because it's a feeling, it's like an inner contentment, an inner peace on the inside of you. It doesn't depend on what's happening on the outside. Exactly. Yes. Okay. Now what are, because I'm sure a lot of people have heard you say love your neighbor. Yes. Now, now you've, you've answered the question for us about how to love yourself. Um, it's not yourself, it's not ego. Yes. It's about loving who God made you to be. Yes. And, and having confidence in who you are. Yes. In God. Yes. Okay. Now how do you love your neighbor? I know Jesus taught a parable on it and yes. just showed us how a Samaritan who, who never really had dealings with the Jews showed tremendous love to Jews. So how are practical ways in which you can love your neighbor? That's a lovely question. And I actually have some practical points in my book. This thing about loving your neighbor is one of the easiest things. Just think about yourself. What do you like? I like food. I like to go out. I like entertainment. Okay, I like all these things. Why not invite my neighbors out to my house for a meal? We've invited, my wife and I have invited quite a number of our neighbors to our home for meals. In my community, I run the neighborhood watch to make sure that everything is okay in the community. Because I want people to look out for my home. I'm not, I'm not in London at the moment. My house is there. I would want our neighbors to look out for, if they saw someone that they don't know, walking around my home. I would want them to approach the person, who are you? You're just looking out for me. And I should also repay the same. Whatever I want people, or whatever I want done to me, I do for others as well. I like it when people invite me out, you know, invite me to their home, cook a meal, invite us maybe to play a game, chess, or whatever it might be. I, I love that. So I too can invite my neighbors, I can invite my friends, white, black, whatever they are. They are all people, God made us all. I like your answer, whatever they are, because the, Jesus told the story of the Good Samaritan in response to the question, who is my neighbor? Now, if your neighbor is an unlikable person, how do you love that neighbor? When you say unlikable, you mean people who... He's playing his music, at, uh, uh, loud, blaring off his music at all ends of the day. He is... Um, doesn't say hello when you say hello to him, that kind of person. I do have people like that. And being in the UK, as, as who I am in the UK, I'm not a, um, how do I put myself, or how do I describe it? I'm not uh, an indigent of the UK, if you see what I mean. I am uh, more of a, I immigrated to the UK. So you, sometimes you do get people who are a bit, mm, I don't know him, like, who are you? You're not one of us or whatever. But that's fine. We are all like that, funny enough. I know I'm like that too. I have that in me. You know, I fight it, but I know I have that. Sometimes you see, uh, 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 there are people even on my street who I try to love, but sort of push me away that, no, I don't want your love. But I still do what I can. Let me give you an example of how you can love someone who is somewhat, un or in quotes, unlikable. When I wrote this book, I gave, I put it through the doorpost of all my immediate neighbors, including those who we think are unlikable. One of them sent me an email. He could really identify with the book, because even in the book, I spoke about the restaurant that I used to eat in, and he used to eat in the same restaurant. So he even brought that up. He went through the book, he read the book in a day. And he spoke about how lovely the book is. And this is someone who I felt was, that their family, maybe they, maybe they just don't like us, maybe they just don't want to be our friends. But I still just, I just dropped the book. In, I didn't knock on the door, I just dropped it through their doorposts. And he picked it up. He knew it was me because I put my name and address there. He read the book and sent me an email commenting on the book. That's a practical example. Christmas time, all these same neighbors, I send all of them cards. 
since we started doing that, we've started receiving cards from them as well, even the ones that we feel are unlikable or we felt are unlikable. Okay. We're coming towards the end of the time, unfortunately, yes. that we yes. have. Why should somebody pick up a, couple of, a copy of Joyful? Pick up a copy of Joyful because this is not a motivational book. This is a book about life. This is a book where you can really find out secrets about being yourself. This book is for Christians. This book is for non-Christians. This is not a book that's just, although I do talk about Christ and you can from see Christian from a Christian perspective, and you can see that I do believe that to a very great extent, you can't really find that level of joy without Christ. However, there are principles of the Bible, of Christ's teachings that are applicable universally. Whether you're a Christian or a non-Christian, there are principles of God within this that if you practice, you can find a sense of joy and a sense of peace. But the ultimate joy and the ultimate peace cannot be found without Christ. And that, I make that very clear. Wonderful. Well, viewers, here's the book, Joyful. Um, we'll, we'll let you know where you can get copies of the book, but it is available on, mo on the internet, uh, on Amazon, iBooks, um, what other? Amazon uh, iBooks is a Kobo. Okay. Um, it's on Conga. It's at okay. Latana Bookshops. Okay. It's at Jed Megastores, Pataba. Most book you, can, you can find it at most major booksellers and online. And here's the thing. It's going for 1,500 naira. That's all. So get yourself a copy. Tox, it's been such a great pleasure to have had you on the Heart of the Matter. And Thank you for having I do me. wish you all the best with the book Joyful. I'm going to go through this book as quickly as I possibly can. Thank you very much for coming. It's a pleasure. Viewers, it's been a, a, a pleasure to be able to present this program to you this week. We'll be back again with another episode of the Heart of the Matter next week. So until then, stay blessed. Mm -hmm.